Hello, it's me again. Ruffle Bricks here with a, another tier list video. The last Worms Armageddon tier list video I did got a fair amount of nice feedback and a fair amount of demand for more tier list based content. By a fair amount of demand I mean three comments and by more tier list based content I mean super weapons. And not to be confused with special weapons which are the weapons that you can select for your team which we're going to do a very special video about at some point. Super weapons are essentially weapons that can only be collected via a random crate drop and they tend to bring an air of spectacular chaos into proceedings. Uh, I never used to talk like this. Now my last tier list video revolved around deathmatch speedruns and this one does as well but I've actually held off from doing this video for a while because super weapons don't tend to crop up in deathmatch that often. There's a whole bunch of criteria that affect the probability of super weapons appearing in crates which means that it's actually pretty unlikely for you to get a super weapon from normal crate drops in deathmatch. The highest chance you've got of getting super weapons is if you get a crate shower as every weapon has an equal chance of appearing in crates spawned in this manner. Nonetheless today we're going to rank the 17 super weapons plus a couple of weapons that aren't technically super weapons but I've got no other lists that I'm going to be able to put them in so we might as well look at them here. No weapon left behind. Much like the previous tier list that I did we're going to judge all these weapons based on how much they would help for a Worms Armageddon deathmatch speedrun. So we'll be looking at things like power, execution, how much RNG affects the outcome. Just general usefulness for or speeding up the game is what we're looking for with these weapons. So we're going to start with a couple of weapons from the F2 hotkey, the first of which being the banana bomb. Uh, this does make for a bit of a weird start to this video I'll grant you because the banana bomb is not technically a super weapon. In deathmatch you can only get it via crate which is why I'm classifying it as a super weapon for the time being and it is also pretty damn high powered. Banana bombs are essentially a much higher powered version of cluster bombs and because of their general power they can be used casually a lot more than cluster bombs can. By casually I mean if you just happen to throw a banana bomb at an enemy worm then chances are it will do a fair amount of damage. The initial explosion of the banana can do up to 75 damage then once the initial banana explodes five other bananalets fly out as well. I mean I say bananalets they're pretty much the same size and the explosions also do up to 75 damage each so you can't say you're not at least getting your five a day with this weapon. You can also do the cluster trick with the banana bombs or banana trick as we call it in this instance. The main enemy worm that you attack with the banana trick is likely to take over 400 damage so a very easy insta kill but also because of the circumference of the various banana explosions then if you've got worms who are maybe slightly further away though still within explosion range then they can still get one shotted as well as a result of the banana trick. Main drawback with the banana bomb is the spread of the bananalets are once again RNG influenced and if you're trying to use them to clear a fairly wide area where a bunch of worms are scattered around then you do have to rely on a bit of luck for all the bananas to land in the correct places. Another thing to note is that banana bombs being a particularly rubbery fruit are quite bouncy. Their bounce physics are identical to that of a max bounce grenade or cluster bomb so if you're throwing them quite a long way or from quite a big height then their landing might not be as smooth as you need it to be. But otherwise banana bombs very good source of potassium and provide quite a k-pop as a result so I'm gonna pop this in the great tier. The next and final weapon from F2 is the earthquake. If you've ever wanted to grab your monitor and just shake it around until all of the worms are in better positions then Earthquake is probably the best way of doing that without actually causing any damage to your hardware. Once activated the Earthquake basically just destabilizes the fault line of the map and everything just rumbles about for around 8 seconds. This is a global weapon so it affects all worms on the map not just the enemy worms. It also affects inanimate objects like mines and oil drums and crates. This means that the weapon is particularly good if you've got 
enemy worms on the side of a cliff face where they can easily be knocked into the water or if you've got like oil drums or mines that you want to drop onto some enemy worms who might be in a trough or a valley then earthquake would be just the ticket for that you do of course have to be careful on where your worms are in all this so it is only a weapon that you want to use once all of your worms are in a safe place where they're not going to be affected too much another thing to note is that the shakes are quite rng so in terms of how much they might get knocked up in the air or which direction they go in that can vary considerably depending on what kind of terrain they're on at the time the flatter the terrain they're on the more likelihood there is of them maybe not going where you'd like them to but more often than not this weapon can be a big game changer well, i'm gonna pop this one in the great tier as well and i think i'm gonna pop it just above the bananas actually i think on balance i might put this below the banana i feel like with a banana you can use that on any map whereas the earthquake it, you kind of need specific circumstances for that to be useful uh, one entry from F3 next in the form of the misleadingly named minigun. This is the other weapon along with the banana bomb that isn't technically a super weapon so you could argue it shouldn't be in this list at all but much like the banana bomb you can only get these in crates in deathmatch and if I was to do a tier list which was basically non-super or special weapons that you can only get in crates then it would be a very short video. Banana versus minigun. Hmm. Minigun is basically just an Uzi but with twice as many bullets in so you can actually do a hundred damage with a minigun provided that much like the Uzi you get a enemy worm up against the wall so that they absorb all of the bullets it's apparently quite a good weapon for launching worms who are on a slope up into the air and into the water as well although I've not actually really had much chance to try this myself main problem with the minigun is the bullet spread is RNG I feel like this is going to be a common theme in this particular tier list so the further away you are from your target the less accurate the bullets are going to be but genuinely uh, these are always welcome whenever they come up in crate drops because you never quite know when you're going to have a straggler worm who can't be killed as part of a pile and so having a minigun just gives you extra options to be able to deal with them individually if you need to and I'm going to pop this one in the great tier as well I, <laughs> I, pro I promise you they're not all going to go in here all of these tiers will get a look in, in this list. It's going to be fairly low in the great tier just because you can only really kill one worm with it at a time. Or maybe a few if there's a few up against the wall. But um, yeah, it, it works really well for that purpose. Jumping into the F6s now where we've got a few strike based weapons. First one of which being the always topical male strike. I have to say presentation wise I think this is one of the most fun weapons in the game. Just the fact that the bombs are delivered by a flying post box means that for sheer visual clout this is one of my favourite weapons in the game. Plus there's also something very calming about the way that the letters just kind of like float down to the ground. But in terms of how useful they are, hmm. The male strike's main strength is that each of the five letters that are dropped can do 50 damage each. So as far as the aerial strike weapons go, this is a pretty powerful example of one. However, these letters are heavily affected by wind as they go down. And also the spread is a little bit random. So because of that, this can be a particularly hard weapon to control. Another really annoying thing about the male strike is where the letters drop in relation to where you place the cursor. For most of the strike weapons in the game the cursor is central in relation to where all of the bombs drop with the exception of napalm strike where the flames actually drop behind the cursor male strike however is slightly baffling in that the letters all drop ahead of the cursor and because you don't end up using male strike very often in deathmatch runs then you can end up forgetting that fact so all of these problems conspire towards making the male strike very much a second class weapon and because of that gonna pop this one in the average tier next up in f6 we've got the mine strike this one basically just takes the classic mine and drops five of them onto the terrain it has similar pros and cons to the mail strike as the explosions from the mines are obviously the same as normal mines so those can do up to 50 damage which having five of those in one go can be pretty potent but if you've ever knocked a mine off a cliff or any other high surface and watched it bounce around for ages 
you'll know that these mines falling from a great high is going to cause them to go all over the place. The exception here is once again if you've got like a bunch of worms in a valley or trough and you know that the mines can funnel quite easily down there that can get some good damage but that situation can be fairly specific. So yeah I do think these are fun but they're quite chaotic and I think these have to go in the average tier as well. I think I'll put them above the male strike just because I feel like I've had better outcomes with the mines than I have with male strikes generally in deathmatch. Like at least with the mine strike, if some one or two of the mines miss, then you've got like leftover mines on the map usually. So that gives you something else you can use maybe on a future turn or something. Rounding off the F6s here, we have the Mole Squadron. The Mole is of course a special weapon, which pretty much no one uses for deathmatch speedruns at this point. I do quite like Moles, but their usage in deathmatch is pretty rarefied. A Mole Squadron can be quite welcome on particularly thick terrain, as it drops five Moles onto the land, all of which just dig straight down into the water. And if you drop a Mole squadron next to some enemy worms then provided you drop it to the right that can actually give you some good opportunities for plopping those worms particularly if they're not in a massively ploppable situation already for those of you who don't know the enemy worms in worms armageddon have a rightward bias so they will generally try to walk right as much as they can so it can be good for getting some decent plopping opportunities on trickier maps the problem is though you need big thick terrain to be able to make that work because the moment the mole comes out of land and goes back into the air then when it hits the next part of terrain it will explode. So if you try to use it on multi-tiered maps then that's not going to be particularly helpful. And the explosions don't do that much damage either, they're like 30 HP maximum. So yeah, once again, fun as this weapon can be, their usage is so specific uh, in deathmatch speedruns that it, like its F6 counterparts, I can only put this one in the average tier. And I'm going to put this at the bottom of the average tier just because it doesn't have the same firepower that the other two strikes that we covered do. Into F7 now with IKEA's best-selling product, the Gerda Starter Pack. You'll probably remember from my deathmatch weapon tier lists that I rated Gerda particularly low due to the fact that it doesn't really offer you many good ways of speeding up the gameplay. It probably won't surprise you to learn that I don't think adding another four Gerdas to your turn does anything to change that. If anything, it just drags things out. There might be some fringe situation where you've used up all of your ninja ropes and all of your select worms and your jetpack, and to get to the last remaining enemy worm you have to kill off then Placing five girders on the landscape might just be the clincher, but that is a very, very rare instance. So I can confidently say this one belongs in the Dozy Bugger tier. Formerly known as the Blood and Stomach Pills tier, but I've got to try and get more of those Yorkshire catchphrases into common parlance. Next up in F8, we have got the Scales of Justice. This is a very interesting weapon, this one. What it does is it takes the HP from all of the worms on the map and then rebalances it so that each team has equal HP overall. That being said, it's not hugely useful in deathmatch because you need to kind of get it at a specific time of the run. You're going to want to hope that you get this weapon in the later battles of the run, uh, particularly the last two. In the Superstar and Elite battles, you have a 15 versus 2 ambush that you have to deal with. And in the off chance that you get the Scales of Justice right at the beginning of the battle, then that gives you significant advantage over the enemy worms. Let's just crunch the numbers on this now. So, like, you have 100 HP per worm. There are 17 worms on the battlefield in total, so that's 1,700 HP. If we divide that into two, then that means there's 850 HP to be shared between each team. If you divide 850 by two, then assuming you've got the scales of justice at the beginning of the battle, that means each of your worms will have a whopping 425 HP to work with. 
Now if we divide that by the likely damage you're going to get from a enemy bazooka, so around 45, then provided you don't plop, that means your worms can each take nine direct hits from the CPUs, bazookas and grenades. And that means that you can save a lot of time hiding. So that's kind of an ideal situation that you could get scales of justice in, but for a lot of the run you're not going to get something like that. What's more likely is you'll probably end up getting the scales of justice when you're about halfway through a map and the enemy are kind of like running out of HP or you might get it in the early maps where your worms actually outnumber the enemies. And because of that, if you use the scales of justice in those situations, your worms will actually end up with less HP than the enemy worms. Also bear in mind that the scales of justice cannot actually kill any enemy worms in and of itself so because of that it's a turn that you are taking to not actually kill a worm and you need to decide whether that's going to be useful for you or not. So yeah if you get this when your workforce is a little depleted compared to the CPU then this very much can be a lifesaver. But I would say if you're speedrunning deathmatch right, then you're probably not going to get that much use out of this. So I'm going to pop this in the average tier. I'm going to put it above the Mole Squadron just because I think it's more broadly useful, but it's less likely to do actual damage to uh, enemies than the Strikes. Some superfood now to start off the F9s, courtesy of the Super Banana Bomb. Unlike the normal Banana Bomb, this one does technically count as a super weapon. This operates in a pretty similar way, but with some slight changes. Rather than setting the fuse between 1 and 5 seconds as you would with the normal Banana Bomb, the Super Banana Bomb is detonated manually. So you press spacebar when you want the first banana to detonate and then you press it again when you want the bananalet to detonate. The ability to choose when you detonate the bananas though is kind of useful in some degree. Although the detonation on the bananalets happens simultaneously for all five of them so because of that they might not all be in the right position. Another thing to note is that if your worm gets hit by the first banana's explosion in any way, you'll actually lose the turn, which means that the bananalets cannot be detonated manually and they will just detonate after a fixed amount of time. It's a similar mechanic to what happens with sheep or moles or skunks or any animal based weapon where you have to use the space bar to activate certain phases of it. I'm not entirely convinced this adds that much to the banana bomb to be honest with you. It gives you a little bit more control over it but with certain caveats so I am still going to put this in the great tier just because in terms of sheer firepower this weapon is really good but in terms of how useful it is compared to the normal banana bomb uh, I am going to say I'm going to put it below the normal banana bomb. Next up, one of the most rhythmically gifted weapons in the game, the Salvation Army. This is basically a cross between the Old Woman and a slightly less powerful Banana Bomb. When you deploy this weapon, what happens is Mr. Tambourine Man walks along in the same way that an Old Woman would. Then as soon as you've had enough of their percussive ways, you just press the space bar and they will explode in a shower of tambourines. There are five of the Tambourine Bomblets, much like a Banana Bomb, but they actually only do 60 damage each. This is still pretty sizable damage and the initial explosion from the Sally does uh, 75 damage as well or up to. And the fact that it walks as opposed to you throw it or whatever means that can open up some possibilities as to how you use it. Like it can make it easier to put it down into a pit for example or make it walk over a long distance. You don't have forever to set the Sally off unfortunately. You've only got about 10 seconds to do so so it's perhaps not as much of a long range boon as you might think it could be. But if nothing else it's nice to see a weapon that's genuinely happy with its own work. I'm going to pop these into the great tier as well. We're going to pop that one... Pop that one just below the Super Banana Bomb. Concluding the F9s here we have the MB Bomb. A little bit of lore for you on this one. MB are the initials of Martin Brown, who was the head of development and production at Team 17 for quite a while. He also had the nickname Spadge, which is the name of one of the worms on the Team 17 CPU team. So if you ever end up attacking Spadge with an MB bomb, I assume that image would cause Martin quite some consternation. The MB bomb's main advantage is that it has a big explosion. It can do up to 100 damage akin to a holy hand grenade. 
The downside of the MB bomb is his physics are very much like those of the male strike. So as he floats down from the air, you will need to hope that the wind is conducive to push him where you want to go. And even if it is, the way that MB gets blown across the landscape can be quite stop start. Sometimes it will seem like he's floating quite smoothly, then all of a sudden it'll just stall for no apparent reason. So he does decent damage as you'd expect from someone with that level of power, but due to the difficulty in controlling that power, uh, gonna have to pop this in the average tier, although I think just sheer, due to the sheer damage rolls, uh, top of the average tier is where we're gonna put it. Into F10 we go now, and we're going to start off with some antiquing as we look at the priceless Ming vase. What I'm about to say is probably going to make it sound like I've been to too many auctions in my time, but I feel like this one is a little bit of a con. This is basically a lower powered banana bomb. When I say lower powered, I mean the actual explosions from the vase and the shards are the same damage. It's just that you only get three shards rather than five banana lips. There are some mild physics differences here in that the vase operates similarly to a dynamite in terms of if you place it on a worm's head, it will blow that worm upwards. Whereas if you place a banana on a worm's head, it's more likely to blow them downwards. One advantage the Ming vase does have over the banana bomb is you get five seconds of retreat time when you use it rather than three. So much like the dynamite or the mine, it can be quite tactical to use that if you need to get a further distance away. But it just kind of bothers me that there's not enough to distinguish the vase from the banana here really. And due to having two fewer bomblets than the banana, then the actual spread can conspire against you a lot more than the spread of the banana bomb can. The big problem I'm having here is how this tier list matches up with my normal deathmatch weapons tier list because I, I worry that we might be being more harsh on this one than we are on the normal deathmatch because I want to I want to place this in good but I feel like if I place this in good on the normal deathmatch tier list then it would be it wouldn't it wouldn't feel right i think we've raised the standard of what we're willing to accept from weapons in this super weapons tier list and because of that i think i think it's fair to put this in the good tier because otherwise these would probably all go up in the champion tier so you know it would be a meaningless list i would definitely be grateful to get a priceless ming vase in a run but i guess i'm just annoyed at how inferior it is to the banana bomb i feel like it should just have something that makes it more different you know other than its market value next up mon petit pois or something uh it's the french sheep strike i got a b for french in school can you believe that this weapon was inspired by the french farmers protest in 1990 in which they set fire to a truck containing 219 sheep so I guess it's nice that Team 17 made sure they didn't go to waste. French Sheep Strike is a pretty heavy duty aerial weapon. It drops five flaming sheep onto the target, each of which will bounce once and then they will explode on their second contact with terrain. The French National Anthem also plays while that happens, so you should definitely stand up and salute. These sheep aren't as powerful as any of the other sheep that you get in the game. I think you only get 50 damage per explosion from these. What makes this weapon particularly potent is the initial wave you get from them, as having five of them together, dropping them individually onto a target like that. Oh, la resistance is a futile. However, the usefulness of this weapon can dwindle a bit on the second bounce of each sheep just because the RNG means that they can wildly spread across the terrain. It's pretty difficult to know where they are going to go. But because they're on fire, you get a lot of flames involved as well and that helps boost up the damage somewhat. So yeah, a bit, a bit of a tricky one this. I think it's either great or good. I feel we might be selling it a bit short with good, to be honest. I just don't quite know if it's efficient enough to go near the top of great, so let's just pop it uh, above the minigun here and below the earthquake. Next up is Mike's Carpet Bomb, named after Mike's Carpets. I know you want a quality carpet, you want a big selection, you want the right price and you want it now. Get yourself down to Mike's Carpets because they're going fast. 
Mike's Carpets, Armley Leeds and Bradford Road, Batley. Now there's a man who knows his way around a carpet. Oddly enough, this is probably one of the few cultural references in Worms Armageddon that hasn't dated, as in 2022 a pair of brothers actually reopened Mike's Carpets, even bringing the original Mike back to record new adverts. They even do deliveries now, probably. Operationally, this one is very similar to the French Sheep Strike in that it is five projectiles dropped onto the terrain that then bounce around and do additional damage. The difference is that the carpets bounce a lot more than the sheep do, but they do less damage per bounce. Each explosion only does up to 30 damage, and much like the sheep, the bounces of the carpets can be pretty erratic. And because of the low damage that you get from each explosion, coupled with the the bounciness of the carpets this makes it a much less useful weapon although they can do good damage i think they're just a bit too hard to control to make them broadly useful so yeah i'm gonna say that these should go probably somewhere around here just trying to think if they are better than the scales of justice or not i think they might still be broadly more useful than the scales but yeah they're they're not the best. Sorry, Mike, if you're watching. Into the F11s now, where we start with the Concrete Donkey. There is a part of me that wants to try and trash this weapon, just to stoke some ire in the comment section. Like, I kind of want to just go in full ham and be like, oh, here's several reasons why the Concrete Donkey is overrated. But no, quite frankly, I can't think of any. Um, this is a uh, pretty much the main weapon that you would want from a special weapon crate. The Concrete Donkey basically drops down the vertical line. Every time it hits the ground, it causes an explosion that does up to 100 damage and it just keeps on dropping down and down until it goes into the water. The damage on this is phenomenal and if you have a bunch of worms that are kind of like quite close together vertically then yeah this is absolutely a no-brainer. It does of course have the limitation of its vertical axis so if you've got worms that are spread around quite a bit then it might not be quite as useful but let's be honest if the donkey could go diagonally or horizontally then we'd never want any other weapon. So yeah That'll do, Donkey. That'll do. Next up from the F-11s, we have got the Indian nuclear test. At the time that this game was being made, India had done their Pokhran 2 missile test, so that's why the inspiration must have hit Team 17 for this particular weapon. The Indian nuclear test has two main effects that it does on the landscape. The first is that it poisons every single worm on the map, including your own. The second effect is that it raises the water level by 120 pixels. In terms of how much these effects help in a deathmatch speed run, I've already discussed my issues with poisoning in the deathmatch weapons tier list. Basically, it just takes everyone too long to kind of get weak enough for the poison to pay off. Plus also, the poison tick between every turn adds two seconds to the runtime of the battle. So there are little minor time losses there that you might want to consider whether those are worth it or not. The water level, on the other hand, is a particularly useful aspect of this weapon especially if you've got a bunch of worms lower down that you need to tackle. Much like the earthquake, you're going to need to ensure that you've got enough worms out of the drowning line here so that you don't end up killing yourself off in the process. Whereas if you have a chonkier island for your map and all the enemy worms are near the top, then this is not going to be quite as helpful. So yeah, it's decent in the right circumstances, maybe not quite enough circumstances for this to be great tier, but I would happily put this at the top of the good tier. Next up, we have the name of the game, Armageddon. Um, hmm... Tricky one this. I'm trying to be as rational as possible about this one, but the fact of the matter is that this is the most powerful weapon in the game by far. So powerful in fact that there is a distinct chance that you may not even be able to survive it depending on when you operate it. Once you activate it a bunch of meteors will fall onto the landscape for a whopping 20 seconds. All of the meteors are affected by RNG so you never quite know where they're going to hit and at what damage. The explosion sizes do vary considerably from from meteor to meteor, so some will be more powerful than others. If you dark side one of your worms by popping them into a nicely sheltered cavern, then that can work towards ensuring that you survive this, but it's not necessarily guaranteed. So this can seem like quite a reckless weapon, but 
This list is all about how much these weapons help with speedruns, by which I mean how much time each weapon will help you shave off a battle. And with Armageddon, that can really speed things up a lot. There's also a rule in deathmatch speedruns that if you end up getting a crate with Armageddon in it, you absolutely have to use it. Not immediately or anything, but you have to use it before the battle is over, no matter what state the map is in. It's not a written rule or anything like that, but I think if you do see someone do a deathmatch speedrun and they get Armageddon and they don't use it, then I think you should look down on them. So I am going to pop this into the champion tier, although um, I am going to put it just below the concrete donkey because... Ah, uh, uh, now nah, it's got to go above, hasn't it? And into the F12s now where we go with Freeze. Freeze is basically just skip go, but colder. Your worms basically do nothing, but all of them are encased in an impenetrable block of ice, which means the enemy worms would not be able to get them. In multiplayer games, there are ways that your opponent could deal with this by like just removing the ground from underneath you with weapons and such. Concrete Donkey is very good for dealing with frozen worms, for example. CPU, however, don't have those particular smarts, so if you do end up freezing, they'll probably just end up skipping go or teleporting or doing something fairly ineffectual. But yeah, if you're going to skip turn for whatever reason and you've got one of these on you you might want to use it but to be honest with you i i wouldn't bother i put in this one in the dozy bugger tier like the girders it's one of those weapons that you're only really going to end up using if you're very much on the back foot and finally the wonder that is patsy's magic bullet I spent some time looking through famous patsies trying to figure out who the inspiration was for this weapon until someone confirmed it was in fact a homage to the biggest patsy of them all, Lee Harvey Oswald, the marine who shot President John F. Kennedy. Well, at least he's modest. Patsy's magic bullet is probably one of my favourite weapons in the game, at least visually, because the parade of stars that follow it around just make for a very nice constellation. I'm a simple guy, I like simple colours and shapes, what can I say? This is the most intelligent homing weapon that you get in the game. It's similar to the homing pigeon in that it will try to go around terrain rather than through it, but it's superior to the pigeon in that it is actually educated, so it will do everything in its power to go around particularly annoying pieces of terrain and get to the target that you select. Its homing abilities aren't bulletproof, for want of a better word, so because of that they may still find ways of not reaching the target. But it is pretty efficient for dealing with worms on the other side of the map, and it does up to 100 damage as well. So it's a very clever weapon, it either belongs at the top of great or at the bottom of champion for me, and... I think we've already got enough stuff in great, so let's, let's, just, let's just have a third champion on this just to end with a high. So yeah, that is my tier list for all of the super weapons in Worms Armageddon in the context of how much I'd like to see them in a deathmatch speedrun. Do you agree with these choices? Do you disagree with these choices? What else should I do a tier list about? Thank you very much for watching. This video, it's over.